It is great to see everyone this morning. It's good to have our visitors with us today. If you do not have an outline of the lesson, I don't know, are there any left back there, Corky? If you don't have one, uh, if you'd like to raise your hand, my wife <clears throat> is the one who requested this because she forgot to pick one up. She was making me do this, so it's all her fault. <clears throat> Apparently, she's the only one. I do want to apologize ahead of time for my allergies. Uh, you know, I still, after living 13 years in Quanta, Texas, where we never got any rain, it's still hard for me to get used to the humidity. And uh, these rains are killing me right now. So I will apologize right now for my constant having to clear my throat. But I hope that you are open to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 right now. And we're going to be looking at what Paul describes as the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, in the previous chapter, in chapter 3, Paul compares the law of Moses to the law of Christ, and he shows how the law of Christ is a much superior law. Now, he had just finished telling the Jews how they had kept a veil over their heart as they continued to embrace the law of Moses. But, he says, if they would just turn and embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, that veil would then be removed. In chapter 4, he's going to tell us more about this glorious gospel. So let's go ahead and begin looking at verses 1 through 7. In verses 1 and 2, he's going to describe his gospel ministry. Paul makes it known to the Corinthian brethren here that his ministry is not his own, but he has received that ministry from God, verse 1. If you notice that Paul constantly had to defend his apostleship. For one reason, he was one who was born out of due time. He came along a lot later than the other 12. And also, he was a minister to the Gentiles, and many of the Jews did not like that. They thought that he was an apostate. And so he was constantly having to defend his apostleship. There was only two places he didn't really have to defend that, and that was to the Thessalonians and to the Philippians. But as an apostle, his ministry was not his. In 2 Corinthians 3, verses 5 and 6, he clearly said, But our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Now, the ministry that he received, of course, was a ministry of reconciliation. The word reconcile simply means to unite or to bring together. The ministry of Christ and the ministry of reconciliation brings us together back to God. Just a little bit later in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 and 19, notice what Paul said. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, when Jesus reconciles us to God, he unites us back to God. Now, unlike the sacrifices of the Old Testament that simply atone for people's sins, which actually didn't remove the sins, they were remembered year after year, rolled forward every year. But through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are now reconciled to God. Our sins are no longer imputed to us. But when God now forgives us through the blood of Jesus Christ, he forgets those sins. So Jesus doesn't, uh, his blood does not atone for our sins, but through his blood we are reconciled back to God. We are completely forgiven of our sins. Now Paul ministered, he said, because of the mercy that he received. Remember what Paul told Timothy there in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13. He describes himself in his former state as Saul of Tarsus. And he said, Before I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Yet, he says, I have received mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Because his heart and because his intentions were right, he was able to respond correctly to the gospel when he heard it. If you remember what happened to Saul of Tarsus, <clears throat> Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. And there he finally realized that the one whom he was persecuting was Jesus 
the Lord himself, the promised Messiah. And Saul was told to go into Damascus and he would be told what he had to do. And so Jesus had appeared to a man by the name of Ananias and he told him that Saul had been in the city praying for three days and I want you to go to him and I want you to minister to him. Well, you know how Ananias felt about that. He was deathly afraid of Saul of Tarsus because of the way Saul himself described himself. He was a blasphemer, he was a persecutor, and he was injurious. And so he was afraid of this man. But Jesus assured him in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 through 16, he tells Ananias, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the, before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And you know, Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, accepted the responsibilities of the gospel. And he obeyed the gospel, and he became one of the greatest apostles that we know, writing more than half of the New Testament that we have in our hands. If we truly appreciate the mercy that the Lord has shown unto us, we too will want to share it with others. It doesn't matter what the consequences might be. It doesn't matter the persecution that may come upon us. We will want to share this gospel with other people. Now, Paul had a responsibility, and he had to be faithful in that responsibility, just like we do. In fact, he said, therefore, seeing we had this ministry, we faint not. And that word, therefore, simply means because of this, because of the excelling glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ over the law of Moses. He said, because of this, we faint not. He does not allow trial or fear to keep him from these tasks because this is the ministration of life. In verse 2, Paul's going to denounce many of the accusations that had been made against him. Uh, he said, he did not walk in craftiness, and neither should we. The word craftiness simply means trickery or underhandedness. Now I want you to notice how Paul described the works of Satan in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, just about seven chapters later. Notice what he says. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now the interesting word, thing about that word subtlety it's the same Greek word as the word craftiness in our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The word craftiness simply means, again, something that is uh, underhanded. And that's the way Satan works. He is very underhanded in what he does. Now, Paul, if you'll notice, he had been accused of being, being the same way that Satan was. He's accused of being crafty. But he denied this. And we need to be careful that we don't fall into the same trap to be crafty like Satan and be one of his emissaries. Now, Paul did not handle the word of God deceitfully, but instead it says he manifested the truth. Remember, deceit and craft, they are the works of false teachers. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, Paul gives us a warning that we walk no more, or he says there in, in verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, and slight of man, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And here we see that word craftiness again, the same Greek word. So this is how Paul describes false teachers, very crafty. They use the art of deception to persuade the unstable to make them believe that their self-made doctrine is actually divine truth. They corrupt the divine truth, of course, by mingling it with wrong notions, and they use just enough truth to make it sound good. But it's just enough to deceive you. When Paul came into Macedonia, he said in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 2 through 4, But even after we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. And this is pretty much, I think, a continuation of 1 Corinthians 2, verse 17. 
For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Paul makes it known and very visible that he was acting in a right and proper manner, and his ministry was not one of deceit, but was one of sincerity. This is the gospel ministry that Paul was committed with and the one that he was committed to. Now in verses 3 and 4, he talks about how this gospel, this glorious gospel, could actually be masked. In other words, it could be hidden. And he says it is hidden to those who are lost. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, he says, To those who are lost, this gospel is nothing but foolishness. They regard it as so, they treat it as nothing but foolishness, and therefore it has no power and no influence over them that they might be saved, as long as they have that attitude. Now, this gospel can be hidden to people, even by us, if we are not careful. I have ten points in here as to how we, ourselves, can actually hide this gospel. First of all, we can hide this gospel when we fail to teach our neighbor. The great commission given by Jesus there in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 16 is very plain and clear. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. We have an obligation to go and teach. And it is to cre teach every creature, including our neighbor. And the reason is because this gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. Romans 1 verse 16. This is why he's, Paul makes this, these uh, words or tells these words in Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So we all as Christians, we have an obligation to teach this gospel to others. And if we don't, we're hiding it. We can also hide the gospel when we fail to send men out with the gospel. We have an obligation to teach others and to do so to have them teach others also. This is how the gospel is propagated. In fact, there in first, or 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul says we are to commit this gospel to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And notice who we're to commit this gospel to, those who are faithful. And if you commit it to somebody else, then it will not be propagated in the right way. In fact, it would be a good chance that they may say or teach something in error. We can also hide this gospel by selfishness. Let's remember, friends and brethren, this is a universal gospel. It is for all people. It is for every creature under heaven. No one is to be left out of the gospel. Now, too often, we want to just take this gospel. We just want to share it to those in our neighborhood because they're our friends, they're the ones that we're familiar with. Uh, they're the ones who we appreciate the most or like the most. And we don't want to really go into the poorer sides of our communities. And when we do, we're hiding the gospel. Sometimes, of course, we just want to keep it to ourselves. We don't want to share it with anybody. I think that Brother Fawcett is doing a great work. Every Saturday, he and a small group of people go out and they do door, door knocking. And if you have the opportunity, you need to join up with them. Uh, they meet, I think they usually go out at between 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock every Saturday evening. And if you have the opportunity, this is good for you to do so, to go out and share the gospel with other people in your community and throughout this town. We can also hide this gospel by our ugliness and our, ug our harshness and ugly attitude. Uh, we always have to speak the truth in love. In 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, we are told that, Yea, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's no doubt about that. But some have gone to an extreme and think well, they have to suffer per persecution in order to be godly. And therefore, they present the gospel in a very harsh fashion. Well, we have to learn to use a little tact in what we do when we do teach the gospel to others. But then, on the other hand, we can also hide the gospel by being overly diplomatic or tactful. Uh, in fact, there are some congregations that you can walk in lost and leave lost and never know the difference. 
we do have to let people know when they are in a lost condition. We have to preach the whole counsel of God. We do have to show them that they are lost, otherwise they probably won't ever know it. So you can hide the gospel by either extreme. You can be extremely harsh and turn people off immediately, or you can be overly tactful and they would never know that they're lost. So you have to find a good midpoint when we present the gospel. And then number six, we can hide this gospel by failing to walk worthy. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4 verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. In other words, we're to walk according to the word of God. In 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, Paul tells Timothy he is to be an example of the believers. In other words, we have to show the world what the true church is. Not just teach them the gospel, but just show them what the gospel is by the lives that we live. We might be the only gospel someone ever reads. So we have to be careful of the example that we present. You know, the idea of, well, just do as I say and not as I do is not a right concept. We need to not just teach them the gospel, but we have to show them how to live the gospel. We can also hide the gospel by putting an emphasis on something other than the gospel itself. If we emphasize our hobbies that we like to do above everything else, well then, we're really not pulling our weight in the church like we should. We're not doing what, the God, what God wants us to do concerning his word. And sometimes we even emphasize ourselves. If we emphasize ourselves, we put ourselves in the forefront, then we usually will conceal the bigger, more important things, like the gospel itself. You know, I'm not a magician, but did you know I could hide a, an actual 747 jumbo jet behind me? All I have to do is present myself far enough in front of that jet and put that jet far enough behind me that I can actually conceal that jet. And we can do the same thing with the gospel by pushing ourselves up front and hiding the gospel behind us. We can also hide this gospel by corrupting it. In other words, changing it where it's not even recognizable. Now the Pharisees of Jesus' day, that's what they did with the law of God. They changed it so much that it was not even recognizable. And that's why Jesus had so much trouble trying to get the people to understand what the law really said. But you know, denominationalism does the same thing with the gospel of Christ today. They change it so much that you can't even recognize it as the gospel of Christ. And then, of course, we can also hide the gospel by being afraid to be different. We all want to be liked. I don't know very many people that like contention. Now, there are some that do, but most of us don't. But you know, God said in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So yes, he wants us to be different. He wants us to be a peculiar people, a holy nation. How can we be the light of the world if we are not different from the world? And then we can hide this gospel by burying our talents. You know, so many people say, I can't, and therefore they don't. And every time I would try to tell my dad, I can't do that. You know what he always told me? Can't never could do nothing. And he's right. As long as you have the attitude, I can't, you never will. And we need to be changing our attitudes on this. The church at Laodicea was such a congregation, and they sickened the Lord, literally, because they were lukewarm, they did nothing, and all they did is they sat around with folded arms. And that made Jesus sick because they pretty much had that attitude, I can't, and therefore they didn't. You know, the gospel is not to be hidden. It is to shine, and it is to shine brightly. Remember the words of Jesus there in Matthew chapter uh, 5, verses 14 through 16? He says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth all light to all that are in the house. 
And he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, we don't shine just simply because of who we are per se. But we are to shine in this world because of the glorious, the light of the glorious gospel that is within us. It is to illuminate us and we are to share that illumination with this world. You know, hiding the gospel is very deadly. It's like hiding somebody's heart medicine, something that's necessary for them to have life. We need to see the need to distribute this living gospel to others, especially to those who are sick in sin. Then in verses 5 and 6 of our text, we see the gospel message. Now, Paul says that we are not to preach ourselves. It's pretty much what Peter said in 1 Peter 4, verse 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And we're not to preach ourselves, but we're to preach Christ Jesus. So therefore, we are not to try to climb the prestige ladder. Jesus tells us in Matthew 23, verse 11, But he that is greatest among you, he says, shall be your servant. Remember in John chapter 13, <clears throat> Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus great, gave a great lesson on humility as he girded himself with a towel and he went about to wash the disciples' feet. And of course, one of those disciples was Peter himself. And I think that Peter may have been referring to this when he said in 1 Peter 5 verse 5, All of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And of course, we're not to elevate our opinions above the Bible. Remember, an opinion is an opinion, and everybody has one. They're all different, just like our noses. But the Bible is truth, John 17, verse 17. Also, we're not to become vain or prideful. Paul said there in Philippians 2, verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than yourselves. We are to learn to be servants. We're to learn to put others before ourselves. We're to learn our priorities. Remember, God is always first. Others are to be second, and we ourselves are to be third. And then we're not to teach what we have to in order to keep our jobs or our positions in the community. You know, Jesus asked a very provoking question there in Mark chapter 8, verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall he give in exchange for his soul? There is no amount of money or anything or position in this community that's worth losing our soul over. We are to preach Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know, after being derided constantly, Jeremiah just almost gave up. On his ministry in Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9 he says then I said I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name it's like they wore him down and he is ready to give up but the verse doesn't stop right there he says but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay Yes, he thought about giving up, preaching the word of God. But he says, I was weary with trying to do that. I wanted to preach God's word. He had a desire to do so. We see that same desire with uh, Philip as he went up to enjoy himself to the uh, chariot of the Ethiopian eunuch there in Acts chapter 8. And he saw the eunuch, or heard him, one, studying and reading from the book of Isaiah. And he just simply asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I except some man guide me? And then in verse 35 of Acts chapter 8, it says, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Preaching Jesus Christ ought to be a desire that's burning within our hearts, within our bones. And we should not ever try to forbear doing so. But what does it really mean to preach Christ? Well, it means preaching the whole counsel of God, Acts chapter 20, verse 27, not just parts and pieces. You know, there's a lot of people up here in the world today saying, well, you just need to preach the man, not the plan. Well, that's not true. In order to preach the man, you had to preach the plan, and we see that as evidence with the eunuch and Philip. Philip began at the same scripture, and he preached unto him Jesus. 
And as they came to the certain water, the eunuch asked, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So apparently, Philip must have taught him something about baptism, the plan of salvation concerning Jesus Christ. They go together. You can't separate one from the other. This is the gospel message. And then one other thing, one other point from this text is found in verse 7, and we're talking about the gospel messenger. The gospel is to be given by earthen vessels. Every conversion that we read throughout the book of Acts, we see a human being teaching another human being. You don't ever hear about an angel or anything else teaching the gospel, do you? In fact, a good example of this is Saul's conversion. Saul of Tarsus. There he was on the road to Damascus. Jesus himself appeared to him. But Jesus did not teach him what he had to do to be saved. He said, you go into Damascus and it will be told you there what it shall do. And so Jesus has Ananias, a human being, to go to Saul to tell him what he had to do to be saved. We see the same example with Cornelius. Here an angel appeared to Cornelius. But notice what the angel told him there in Acts 11, verse 14. Send for Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Now you wonder why the angel didn't teach Cornelius. He certainly would be capable, probably more capable than Peter himself. But he had a man to go to him because this gospel is to be placed in the hands of men. It is our responsibility to share this gospel with others. And the reason is because, you see, you want the treasure emphasized and not the vessel. You ever notice why jewelers will display diamonds on a black velvet mat? It's to bring out the glory and the greatness of the diamond. If you put it on a shiny background, you'll lose the diamond. Same thing with the gospel. God has placed this gospel in the hands of earthly messengers, you and I, so that the treasure itself, the gospel itself, can shine even brighter. Now, as gospel messengers, we are always to exalt God and not ourselves. I want you to listen to Paul's attitude in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, as we bring this lesson to a close. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of, of men, but in the power of God. Yes, we are not to exalt ourselves. We're not to present ourselves before everybody else and try to hide the gospel behind us. Our job is to present the glorious gospel in its brightness and in its glory. So we as God's messengers, we have to handle this glorious gospel with care, giving it to the world, exalting it above all else, that God may be glorified and that souls may be saved. What about you this morning? Have you responded to the gospel message? The only thing that can save us is the word of God itself. And through the word of God, we understand how to attain or to uh, come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. It's done through baptism, Romans chapter 6, verses 4 through 5. If you have not obeyed that gospel, have not been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, won't you do that this morning? If you need more study, there are plenty of people in this congregation, not just me, but numerous people can study with you to help you understand what you need to do to be saved. If there's something that you need, if you need more help, if you need the prayers of the congregation, whatever it may be, we encourage you to respond this morning while together we stand and sing.